enjoy <laughs> and we'll fire on and we'll take time to ask some questions. So when you find right. ready, take Thanks, it away. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Um, really nice to, to be here and see all of you. Welcome to my TED Talk. I guess it's more of a TED Talk kind of format here since we're going so quick. Um, I won't give you my life story, but my name's Shelby Hanna. I am originally from Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma in the States, but I moved to Northern Ireland about 13 years ago. So that's why I talk like this. So apologize in advance to everyone in the room. I, uh, I work as a digital learning officer in the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences at Queen's University in Belfast. I have worked there for about the last five years. Uh, so what I want to talk to you about today um, on the menu today is, first of all, what the metaverse is and isn't, because there's always a bit of confusion anytime I talk about it. Um, some conflation, and, and it, I'm going to define exactly what I mean when I'm talking about the metaverse here. Some early explorations we've done in Queen's University Belfast, so this is all very nascent, it's all very new, but I'm going to tell you what we've done and what we've learned from what we've done so far. The context of good, what, so what is good in terms of online learning and how does the metaverse feed into that? Uh, practical advice, so if anyone's wanting to go away and try this on your own, I have some very solid um, evidence pieces of advice for you. The question of openness, of course, we are at the OER conference, so I want to talk to you about how is the metaverse an open resource, what open res resources are available there, and how will that can probably, in all probability, continue to grow as we go forward um, through this, down this technology path. And we're going to end with some nice pictures, just to leave you with a nice, good image of you, in your mind about what this looks like. So I'm going to start with a surprise that's not going to come to as a surprise to many of you, and that surprise, I'm going to go Okay, right here at the beginning is that the metaverse doesn't exist yet. <laughs> so if it doesn't exist yet, why are we talking about it? And this is one of those things that's really, really overhyped. Why should we as educators care about NFTs and cryptocurrency and all this nonsense? Why does it matter to us? And the answer, I think, has something to do with this guy. <laughs> and whether you dislike Mark Zuckerberg or you hate him, <laughs> yeah. He is one of the biggest metaverse cheerleaders out there, and he's using his considerable resources to make it a reality. Um, but how do you define it? It's not a reality yet. So how do, how do we actually say what it is? Um, so Matthew Ball, who's another metaverse expert stroke cheerleader, defines it as a massively scaled, interoperable network of real-time 3D virtual worlds. Tony Parisi, another expert in this area, calls it um, spatially organized real-time 3D content. So a lot of times you'll hear this referred to as Web3. Web1 being the internet as we know it, you know, that old dialogue, that kind of internet. Web2 being social media and the mobile revolution. Web3 being the metaverse, the three-dimensional web. So instead of web sites, we're looking to have in web spaces. Um, and not necessarily um, walking around and at MBR, although that, that may be a piece of it, which we'll get into in the next slide, but that you'll be um, interacting with the internet in a more immersive um, three-dimensional way. So one thing to mention um, is that VR is often conflated with metaverse. VR exists, it already exists, we already know. It has a great application, it's already being used for education things that are too far, too small, too dangerous, that kind of stuff, brilliant. I think there's a lot to be said for VR. It's not the metaverse. It's not exactly the same thing. And there's a lot of conflation there. So I just wanted to draw that line that there is a difference between the two. I think of VR as being like an early computer. And computers were great. It's not until we hooked them all up to the internet that we actually got the power and the openness that we have now. So the metaverse seems like science fiction. And what we're talking about here it, it is often portrayed in science fiction. Um, and idea, the idea did come from science fiction. So um, what I think what we're talking about here is that a lot of companies are, and not just Mark Zuckerberg, but lots of other companies like Google and Microsoft are pouring in tons of money to make Web3 a reality. So I think this is why we should care as educators, because if this is going to change the way we interact with the internet, this is definitely going to change the way students interact with their education. In the context of this, I want to share with you as well to, to <coughs> these seven rules of the metaverse. So this is how he's defining it. And um, essentially, you can see here, the, the crux of this is that, and the, the most important rule is that the metaverse is the internet. It's the next evolution of the internet. 
So a lot of companies now will try to sell you uh, the same, this is the metaverse. Come by the metaverse. This is your metaverse space. Do this. It's like not exactly it, the metaverse doesn't exist. So you, they can't sell it to you yet because it doesn't it doesn't exist. So, but if it doesn't exist now, when will it? I guess is the next question. Um, Tony Parisi and others have quipped that it will be we will have some form of the metaverse by the end of the decade, as in this decade, as in the end of the 2020s. We will see some early formation of this. So. That's why we care in Queens. We want our education to be future proof. We want it to be immersive for students. We want it to be interesting for students. So what are we doing? We started with an early exploration. Um, I have a, a lecture in our natural school of natural and built environment who is an architect by trade, but he's developing a new program essentially about sustainability. And he has musicians who are also uh, social activists in Colombia, instead of bringing them, flying them all the way over to Belfast from Colombia, you want to see how feasible is their workshop to do in the metaverse. So we started with Mozilla Hubs, which was a free service. It's not anymore. It was when we put in this, the um, pitch for the conferences. The other thing is this stuff is changing so quickly that it's here today, maybe gone tomorrow. But um, essentially what you'll see here is uh, we took what was already an open resource so it was a space that was created in Mozilla Hubs, lifted it from somebody else, remixed it in their in-browser um, editor, which is so fairly easy to create. And then we stuck our Queens, this is part of our campus, a 360 photo in the background. What the musicians did was they took scans of the instruments as they, ha they had created mm -hmm. in their workshops. You can scan these with your phone. If you have a smartphone that's from the last two or three years, you can, there's a host of apps that you can do this with create a 3D model of the instrument, and then plug in tutorials about how to do that in the background. You can see another example here is a guitar they've created from a hubcap. And we used um, photographs of murals from Comune uh, de in Medellin, where they're from, um, to kind of set the atmosphere, to give a sense of where they're from. Since they're musicians, we also put some music in this space. So we had this sort of immersive multimedia space going on. And this is another example of a, a drum that they created, again, with the tutorials in the background. Um, the other thing about creating these 3D objects is if students, and I forgot to mention, students can um, inter uh, interact with this from their laptops, from their phones, and also from a VR headset. So it's um, hardware agnostic, which is one of Tony Parisi's rules. Um, so they, they were able to manipulate that three-dimensional object, not play it yet. That's not something the metaverse has figured out how to do. Um, or that this space is figured out how to do, but they can, if they're in VR, they can rescale it, they can move it around. The laws of physics apply, they can actually chuck it across the room if they wanted to. So with this workshop, um, we did run a test and a couple of proof of concepts. I would say we had mixed success. Um, you definitely get what Mr. Kitties calls a sense of co-presence in the form of language anxiety for me, because the musicians did not really speak English. I don't really speak Spanish. So we were there in the same room. And it was that really familiar feeling of not speaking the same language. I don't know if you travel to another country and you have that like, ah, okay, yeah, that kind of anxiety, it was there. So I actually take that to be a good sign. If you kind of experience that online, then there's probably something more human and more visceral about that interaction that you're having with people. Um, but we did have some serious technical issues in terms of the YouTube videos now playing, um, various pieces, it didn't like the textures of the 3D models. So we looked around for some other um, platforms. The, the focus of the course was shifting as well from doing workshops in the metaverse to doing field work. So we were trying to get students who are already in work, who maybe don't have time to go wander around Northern Ireland or, or Ireland more generally to do field work. So what we're looking at is putting the field work element of the course into the metaverse. So this is just a proof of concept we did. Um, this is a park next to um, Queen's University of Belfast. We hooked it up with a lot of other 360 videos or 360 photos. If you've ever used ThingLink, it's very like ThingLink, except that the advantage here is that you and the guys of your avatar can wander around inside of this and you can put 3D objects in there. But again, you can manipulate. Um, in the meantime, we're also moving forward with a few other projects. That program that I was mentioning there with the field work doesn't start until September 2024. 
So what we want to do is get more practical experience, try to get students in, um, and also try to build a community of other people working in this space. What I found in trying to do those early explorations is that's really hard to do this on your own. And we have the expertise in Queens. We have lots of people working in this space. What we put together is a metaverse community of practice. So um, we started with the Lego series play. If you're not familiar with the methodology, I know Claire is familiar with the methodology, but if you're not, it's just a problem solving methodology. So we were talking about what kind of projects would we like to pursue? What would work well in the metaverse? What would be a value add to our educational goals in the metaverse? So a couple of projects that we're starting on here. Um, this is what we already do for our architecture students. We do a 3D model of their end of year show. So you can actually go online to a website and wander around their show as if you were there. But what we're actually looking to do is get them to upload their architectural models, their digital models into the metaverse so that people can have their critique online inside of their architectural models. So even people who are very experienced readers and blueprints say that this is a different experience for them. So that's one project we're doing. We're also looking at a sensory space for children with autism um, as part of a behavioral, um, I've forgotten the name, but a, a, a research into behavior about um, autism and whether or not VR spaces can be of help to these, student, to these uh, children. And another one about preserving um, uh, human tissue samples for our anatomy department because the situ samples are kept in really old carcinogenic liquids and it's very difficult, it's very dangerous to be bringing them out to show them to students. So we're looking at digitizing those 3D models, but there's all kinds of hangups around the, the legislation. You can't just be putting these things online. So you have to control that really carefully. So this is kind of some of the things that we're doing. In addition, the modern languages department approached me to say, we have all these great photos that students have taken on their year abroad, but we don't have enough space to actually show them. Can you help us? So this is something that's spatial. The, the, the next um, the, the, uh, platform I was talking about there does really well. So essentially you have a, a template for an art gallery. You upload your photos. It's very quick. The feedback on that was pretty positive. So the students were pretty happy with that. That's the only time we've actually been able to use it with students so far is all very in the very early stages. So far, they're happy. But in terms of, it's not really there to make the students happy. So what we're still trying to do is figure out what is good. If you start talking about the metaverse and teaching, this is the kind of image that tends to bubble up. And this seems like a dystopian image to me. I don't know about you guys, it looks horrible. <laughs> I don't want to be sat in a replica of a boring room in some kind of crazy avatar, just basically watching a screen within a screen. So we have to think about where is the value at? You know, we don't want to use the tech just for the sake of using it. We want to use it to get something out of it, to, to really push forward and to make the online learning experience good. So Paul Whedon and Weller talk about what is good online learning. And this is their kind of their six best practices. And I think the metaverse can help with at least four of those in terms of building a community, in terms of exchanging ideas, using your online tools for interaction because the interaction in the metaverse is so much more natural and so much more immersive. Um, and in particular, creating an environment that's not just student centered. In this case, you could have an environment that is student designed. Imagine going into different workshops or different classes in a space that the student has actually designed themselves, purpose built for a lesson that they've created or an architectural model that they've designed. So I think that's where the real exciting possibilities would lie. For practical advice, I would say define your learning objectives. So it's a mistake that we have made. Um, always be clear what you want before you go in. Don't limit yourself to one platform. There are literally dozens at this point, and we don't know which one or where the metaverse is going to go, what it's going to be like. In all likelihood, the one you choose is going to be passe in five years. So don't worry too much about it. Don't get too over-invested in one platform. Again, it can change. It can be free today. It can be paid tomorrow. You don't know. So just um, define what you want from the platform <coughs> and be okay with being flexible and be okay with it not being the one that you're gonna stick with forever. The last piece of advice, build in a test session. Always, always, always say, okay, this is a session with absolutely no stakes writing on it. The whole point of this session is for you to come in, get used to it, because it's a bit of a learning curve, learning how to interact with these spaces, work out your tech, work out your Wi-Fi, that kind of thing. So I would always, always, always build in a test session. So in addition to, and I mentioned this briefly before, in addition to open textbooks and open lesson plans, 
what we're seeing now is the emergence of open three-dimensional spaces. You can go online right now, build any of these for free, and your students can join your own private room just through a link. Is that done? So just to finish up really quickly, is what I'm saying here is that you can go ahead and start building this now. There's nothing to stop you other than the fear of the unknown. And if you want to come and talk about this, I am very, very keen to talk about it. So thank you very much. Five minutes for questions. Oh, so, right, okay. Yeah, okay. if anybody has any questions for Shelby, we'll take a couple of questions. Yes, okay. thanks, Shelby. I really enjoyed that presentation, but I did have quite a feeling this deja vu of Second Life. <laughs> <laughs> Remember back in on the day, every university had a Second Life campus, and we rebuilt the whole campus, and it was, but there's a lot of research, and a lot of people did a lot of really good work in these in Second Life. Mm -hmm. So I think there's possibly, we sometimes not to forget that I know my experiences of Second Life were just like having a crazy avatar and spinning around and around and then my computer crashing. Um, but I think there's a lot that could be learned for this next phase um, as well. So I just, um, not really a question, but I think you're doing great work, but wanted to. Yeah, I think Second Life is one that comes up over and over again. And the people who are working in this space would be people who have been there yes. and, and worked in Second Life for a long time. I think where Second Life falls down and where the metaverse has the potential to fall down is if you don't know what you want out of it, you get students in and you go, well, that's cool. <laughs> what do I do not? You know, so it, I think that's where the, you have to really focus on what your learning objectives are. And I don't see this, at least now, being the kind of thing you use every single week in your teaching. It's probably you do a workshop here, you do some field work there. You maybe have a kind of, you can do even like training simulations. So I think at the moment, what we're looking at is really, really focused very um, deliberate uses of it. Uh, but yeah, I, I can see that the, the problem you go to Second Life and you're like, well, oh, I can move around. It's like a video game. This is really cool. And it's cool for about two hours. <laughs> two minutes in my case. Two minutes. <laughs> yeah, no, my question was about the Second Life part and the crashing part of that, because whenever you put up the very C things, the metaverse is for everyone. Mm -hmm. So everyone with the hardware, everyone with the internet. Mm. So it's just how much of that bandwidth is available to people? Is mm. it as heavy as Second Life? Because like my really high end work computer, I don't think I ever got Second Life. Oh, probably. Yeah. So is this lighter? It is. Li well, and typically they are lighter these days because they're all browser based. Um, so you don't even have to install or download <coughs> anything for most of these. Um, a lot of people can get on with their phones, was our experience. Um, Tony Parisi in another mm. course talks about widening access. Now, I, you can't <laughs> do much if you, if you don't have an internet connection, you don't have an internet connection. Mm. There's nothing that anyone developing the software can do about that. So it, there is a, there needs to be a piece as well about widening participation in the world in terms of building in broadband infrastructure, building in 5G infrastructure, so that it's available to people to be able to access this kind of space. Because yeah, it won't work if it's a very small subset of the population. There's no point, really. It's not. Hi. Yeah, um, hi. Thanks, thanks for your talk. Um, the, um, what, what platforms are open source? So there's, there's Zuckerberg's one, which will be plain source. Um, which which platforms are you looking at? Well, we looked at several. Um, Mozilla Hubs would be open source. Um, spatial, not open source, but you can develop for it in Unity. So in that case, you you know it's open development, I guess. Um, with some caveats, Frame VR is another one that we've looked at um, that would be open. Although they are they are a paid model as well. Um, so yeah, the thing is, a lot of them that were open are now moving to paid models. So it's not it's not everything that would be open at the moment. Do, do, do you do you do you see it as a um, development of the web or of the internet? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that if it's not that, then it's not the metaverse. Well, no, which one? Which, oh, the, either the web or the internet. What's the, What's the distinction? Sorry. Well, the web is the, uh, the browser based. The uh, the um, internet is the infrastructure, the like RSC environments, all these other environments. Right. So they're, they're kind of distinctly. Well, I think the, it has the, to be the World Wide Web yeah. sits on the internet, if you like. 
the, the way I've heard it described is that the metaverse to, to make this stuff run, to make the web available, you're going to have to have a lot of that infrastructure. And that's something that's still being built. And frankly, it doesn't exist. That's why it doesn't exist is because we don't have the technology to be able to run this at scale yet. So it will have to have this infrastructure piece around it. So I guess both is the answer. I think we're going to have to. I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to have to have the questions there. If you've got any questions for Shelby, you can maybe. Uh, uh, let's see what can do with this. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. folks. Okay, Nicholas, I'll let you go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicola Ruiz. I come from Colombia. I'm a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh, but I've come here as the founder of PEP. It's a nonprofit organization that works since 2020 in Colombia as a partner to rural schools and rural teachers uh, Well, to tackle one of the biggest wicked problems that is educational inequity. Um, we do this by using OERs, so we're not solving educational inequity, spoiler, <laughs> but we're learning a lot with teachers from them, and they're also having an opportunity to learn things along the way. Um, yeah, I'm going to begin with a little bit of our context, so you can have a little bit of the idea of how it is back home. Everything began during 2020. Uh, it was a horrible year for rural schools as they had to shut down as any, any other school. But the problem was that only 26% of them had access to both a device and internet and referring to students. So they were sent back home and suddenly they don't have any opportunity to have an approach to education or to continue their educational process. Teachers were really creative. Uh, they printed their own uh, PDFs, uh, they sometimes going to some uh, house to house, knocking doors, providing the printed uh, documents. And well, I must say that what got me into beginning everything was that I have someone that I care about in the rural area and I called her and she told me how uh, her nephew was taking classes. And it was, uh, well, quite, sad not saying anything else and as you remember we were all locked down and people were like some people were like empathic to the situation of others so it wasn't that a non-profit organization at the moment but it was um, an idea to help empathically so well uh, i'm just like jumping around my presentation sorry <laughs> quite nervous but <laughs> um i'm gonna return to that eventually so also, rural schools are multi-grade classrooms, which means that teachers must teach from uh, pre-K to fifth grade at the same time, all of the subjects. Uh, some might argue that <coughs> I have read this in literature, some people that are proposing to come back to multi-grade classroom because it allows many things, but for them it's a disadvantage because uh, they have to do many oh, labors, they have many remits that uh, are not counted into their formal remit. For example, they have to do the cleaning. Some schools are going to have water sometimes. Uh, they have to be attentive that uh, the students are eating. And on top of that, they have to be experts in math, uh, English, while well, they do not speak English, uh, social sciences, everything, and to give class at the same time. So it's a big problem <laughs> what we have back home. It's a big problem. And for example, um, only 2% of rural students access to higher education, historically, while urban students, well, it's another story. So I can tell the story about them with their permission and also the story about my team who are working with them as I'm right now here <laughs> since uh, some months ago. He's ready, uh, one of the school teachers that we work with. And I admire a lot rural teachers in many ways. Because first of all, the history of teaching in Colombia is maybe something that you can relate to because I think teaching as a profession has been uh, not valued and it's not prestigious in many ways. And in Colombia, it had like many layers of violence. For example, it had gender violence. 
only teachers uh, are women because it's not the uh, valid and prestigious job, you know, as being a doctor or whatever. Or uh, teachers are not well paid. So these teachers have built the biggest uh, union, which is called FECODE in Colombia, that has allowed them to win many battles. But on the side, some things has happened. For example, to curriculum design, which is the topic of this conversation, how we co-create OER with rural teachers through participatory curriculum design, has generated center problems. For example, uh, during the 70s in Colombia, the Ministry of Education intended to give every teacher a single curriculum so they could make education teacher-proof. No. Like, so curriculum became as a synonym as instrumentalization of education, and they opposed the word pedagogy to curriculum. That problem uh, evolved to the point that curriculum design is not taught at uh, the universities that are developing teacher professional development, which will, sorry, initial teacher teaching. You got the idea. <laughs> and so, Juni Montoya, which is a researcher, which is studies the history of curriculum in Colombia, argues that it can be evaluated that educators have been right to post government attempts to introduce a teacher proof curriculum, but they have been wrong to prohibit the curriculum and curricular thinking, even from teacher preparation programs. So it became a political battle uh, because, well, they have a lot of reasons to be politically engaged teachers. But as a side thing that happened, curriculum was not part. Colombia has won several political battles. One of these, won by FECODE, the union, is that education is decentralized. And we have a law which allows each school to decide its own curriculum. The downside of this is that uh, as teachers do not do curriculum design, they buy curriculums for from educa uh, editorial houses, you know? So they just buy from it curriculums and just use them. Uh, which was not the idea of having decentralization, in my opinion. Like it was the idea to have autonomy, to have uh, agency and other things that are valid, but it became a business. A big play. So this is the context in which uh, FED is operating right now, um, and now how it was working. <laughs> so this is at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, everything was closed. People were fearing for many reasons, and to move around, you need a, you needed a government permit to actually drive a car outside your house. Your house. Uh, I was I'm trained as an instructional designer or learning designer. The U.S. call it one way, here call it other, uh, and I thought like, well, uh, I'm just in my house. I can maybe do something for someone for these people that I talked with, and just managed to uh, fundraise SIM cards with a small quantity of gigabytes for a several number of families, and also do these uh, WhatsApp campaigns to make receive donations of used laptops or, in this case. Uh, not laptop computers, but other computers. Uh, desktop, yeah, desktop computers. So actually, it was like magic <laughs> because it worked. We managed to uh, raise 21 computers and 21 SIM cards for the families. Uh, I trained the teachers in teaching online with these new resources, uh, which was something that government should be doing, but it's Colombia. And <laughs> it was fantastic. Uh, so this is like the beginning and is like the first stage of the nonprofit. And I'm going to tell you about the second stage. So here we talk a lot about uh, technology and OERs at parts of digitality, like technology and OERs are like married. And in the second step, when uh, more teachers were involved because of the government liked what we were doing and provided us more laptops, but no money for internet. Uh, and we get we got more teachers to be involved. We actually were not doing it right because technology can become a burden, and so OERs. So uh, this is one of the teacher development programs that we were doing with more teachers, and these teachers had caring responsibility. They were scared for their lives and a lot of things, but they were gathering with us, and they were like, well, "Why do I have to learn this?" And oh, they had to learn how to use a uh, Raspberry Pi. <laughs> With Colibri installed, which is fantastic, but it has its learning curve. And some teachers do not have digital uh, literacy, for example, the one in the, in the picture. So it was really distressing at the moment to be in this project where everything was so 
uh, adverse in many ways, and also to on top of that have this new technology and this promise of access, which were OERs in this server uh, that was on, offline. And well, so this was the second stage. Uh, some teachers hated us <laughs> and they were right. <laughs> <laughs> so we learned a lot and it's also something that I want to share here and that's why I talk about participatory curriculum design. When there's technology involved and there's marginalized communities and there's a lot of development projects and you're here in the northern part, sometimes most of OERs go to the south, develop here because we don't have resources to develop or well, people do not have the same resources to develop OERs, but we just like for them. Uh, it's important to think uh, which values are embedded in these and how the processes are done uh, rather than just go and fix something for someone. You know, that's a big mistake. So this is our third, and I'm going to use this picture for our third stage of our process. And in this stage, we decided to just give them more power than having more power us. Thank you. Um, oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, we do this by allowing them to choose how to involve with us, which topics to actually decide uh, to develop the OERs, which is quite important because we noticed that uh, most of the OERs that were embedded in Polygree didn't, weren't, weren't meaningful for them in many ways. For example, there was nothing on Colombian, Colombian history. Math was taught another way than how they teach math. So we embarked in this small but epic journey of co-designing uh, for social inclusion. Maybe you have read this, uh, Arinto, but it's on uh, OER social uh, on the global south. So social inclusion means empowering education students to be the creators of their own materials and knowledge, not just recipients or adapters of their others' work. So we embarked in this journey because it's epic because we have so few resources, <laughs> but at the same time, we have so, so much willingness. And I say that uh, it is being successful at the moment because teachers want to be there. It is not imposed by them, as in the second stage, by the government <coughs> schools, but they just want to be willing there to put part of the time to do this. How do we do this? I'm going to just jump some things through maybe something you know. It's UBD, Understanding by Design. Um, I'm not an advocate for that, it's what uh, we just found it works for us. Uh, and we negotiate everything, 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 everything. From how long where the workshops will be, to when they will be there, and what are the objectives, what everything. We negotiate also how to create the learning objects. <laughs> so this has been beautiful because we have been able to uh, embody their pedagogies, and for example, we have They've made videos on how they teach with verbal skills like storytelling that is uh, vernacular to rural Colombia. And that has been a really beautiful thing to see and how they get excited with this and the final product. And I'm just gonna show a little bit of that if I have time. Here we go. Two, two and a half minutes. So there's gonna be puppets. I hope you like them. <laughs> Oh, we should, uh, Well, <laughs> have to give more visibility to the people who are working right now with the teachers. Uh, it was in, color, in Spanish rhyme, so it is like a way to rhyme to remember things, and it's called rondas, and that's how they play sometimes to, with school songs to learn. 
And this is our Stephanie and Gisela. They are the people that are right now uh, working with the teachers frequently. And well, part of the reflection that we did before me coming here to speak with you was that what they valued more of the process was the social uh, weaving that was made with the teachers. It's not about the technology, at last was what it was being spoken. We have a lot of problems. For example, curriculum design didn't become part of the everyday practice of teachers because they still use the books. Uh, OERs are just still a few of them, but what became like the, the chest at the end of the journey would be that teachers are invested in making and having a community and reflecting about, about their identities, their pedagogies, and how can they can be embodied in this type of exercises. So, um, yeah, uh, I, to make this, to close this, I have here more information for more puppet videos and our webpage. And I would say that um, it's an exception of yeah, being in the middle between the global north and the global south. And you being people that create OERs in the global north, the idea about how do we engage participatory, participatory, participatory methods with the people that you intend to, for example, if it's in the global south, to send OERs or to involve, uh, think about power relationships, think about how technology can make things worse, don't do the same mistakes that we do, and negotiate and let them do whatever they want to do because there's their educational futures and that's their right. So I wanted to share this experience with you and thank you so much for hearing me. We do have a, we do have a few minutes for questions. If you want to take some questions, Nicholas. Yeah. Okay. Do, do you want to count down the timer? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Would you, when do you want that? Um, just you know, 15 minutes, so do you want like, Let's just leave five minutes for okay, questions. I'll, 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 okay, well, I can give you five, count the time up to the end of the presentation, and you still will have five minutes. That sounds fun. Yeah, we're going five minutes. Share it out then. So, good afternoon, morning, I think is where we're at now. Um, so, Shelby mentioned she was a hybrid of Scottish and Oklahoma accents. This will be the full Oklahoma accent. So, we're taking it full circle here. So, my name is uh, Wesley Adam Stroud. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at Oklahoma State University. Uh, my role is the liaison from our library, and I work uh, with ag, animal science, life science, so, but I am not historically a librarian. My uh, path has been through education. I was a teacher for 10 years before I went to uh, the library to start working. My degree, my PhD is in instructional leadership and academic curriculum, so one of my favorite things to talk about is the puzzle of bringing curriculum together to make it work in the classroom in different settings. I said I'm not historically a librarian and I am not traditionally trained in the sense of open ed. I value the conversations very much. I am new to them though. I will, I will be honest in that. But I learned about open ed by default in my experiences teaching. So I am from Oklahoma. Uh, I've been teaching for 10 years. I only have taught one year in the States, though. Uh, my first two years, I was teaching in China at an international school that had 120 students and 24 nationalities represented. So when we're talking about finding resources for populations like that, and if there are any copyright individuals in here, please don't turn me in because when we were at that school, this was in 2009, uh, in the theme of making things open for students, uh, finding a textbook that represented so many voices was near impossible, right? For that many nationalities, that many backgrounds. Uh, so we had to borrow a lot of information off the <laughs> internet, um, print off one copy and then send them to someone who would make additional copies for us and we would distribute those out to our students. So much like I think Nicholas was kind of getting at some of those problems of bringing the materials to students can be complicated. Um, I worked with a group in Uganda for four years where we were creating a, an adult primary education program for women who had been impacted by some of the conflicts that were happening in northern Uganda. 
And in that instance, the government had no support for women who had been abducted in uh, by militant groups in northern Uganda. So when they fled from their situations and came back to maybe their home communities throughout Uganda, they had no opportunity to return to primary education because they were abducted at those ages. So the challenges of developing curriculum, making things open for individuals can be very tricky. And through some of those experiences, that's where I was introduced by default to open ed, of trying to build opportunities for individuals to have access to information, to support those individuals who are building those opportunities for the students. Uh, so that's where I wanted to begin. Now, what I'm going to talk about for here and try to be on theme of some of the, the, the presentations so far today is because I am historically an educator, which button is it? <laughs> we're going to practice here. Okay, great. Because I am historically an educator, I had the, the luck of getting courses in education to prepare, prepare me to be an educator. Now, as my role now at an R1 university, where our university is making movements to hire researchers first and then asking those researchers to then become uh, teachers, that's not always uh, an enjoyable process for those researchers to make that jump into the classroom. And historic, well, you see often those individuals have never had a chance to take an education course. So just talking about overarching topics of education can be tricky. Um, so what I have set out to do, and this took five years, was create a course for doctoral students to take that would give them some preparation to enter and become teachers at the higher education level. So uh, the course that I'm gonna talk about and just give you a little bit of description uh, is designed to help future faculty be engaged in conversations around education, what it means to be a teacher, what the processes of learning look like. So approaching topics of education is a little bit easier. And because if you've worked with faculty or you are faculty or from whatever degree, finding a common area that we can share language around education is sometimes tricky to find. And sometimes we are also hesitant to do that because we don't want to expose ourselves as someone who may not be a in-depth professional first in all of the readings and theories that are out there, right? So we try to find an easy space for individuals to talk about. So um, I <laughs> looked across the 96 different doctoral programs at Oklahoma State University and only one course outline scope and sequence included a course in education. So that means the other, the other 98 uh, individuals who are receiving their PhDs in different fields, whatever it may have been, we're not going to have a gonna, there's that Oklahoma accent coming out. We're not going to have the opportunity to take a course in education. So that is a, a, a wrong that needs to be fixed. So in, I got lucky with some relationships across campus. Uh, it took five years of negotiation between uh, the Spears School of Business. This was uh, one of the colleges in our campus that was most interested in creating a course for their doctoral students. Um, but like I said, it took five years across different deans and department heads for someone to finally sign off and say, oh, it makes sense for a higher education institution to provide training and education for their higher education professionals. So <laughs> after that amount of work, uh, a course was designed titled Instructional Leadership and Academic Curriculum. And this course, as I mentioned, is designed to introduce the nature of education, practices, ideas uh, around education. Uh, this is a class that meets only 16 times for one hour a day, once a week. So that's all they were willing to give time up for to allow these conversations to take place. So we try to cram in as much as possible. These are the topics that we, we look at. Uh, we help. So these are all doctoral students who are getting ready to um, finish their PhDs. And then <laughs> while they're enrolled in this class, they're already going through the process of interviewing, which is already stressful. 
And so what we try to do is one, prepare them to be a teacher, but when they go to these interviews, they have talking points to represent themselves adequately as the teacher that they want to be when they are going to be hired by an institution. So you can see some of the topics that we talk about. Uh, we, we center and begin with uh, looking at ideas around pedagogy, epistemology, uh, curriculum ideology, just so, and I think Shelby said this really well, we don't want them to become teachers who just use the tech because it's there and not know why they're using the tech, right? We try to back up and allow them to have conversations to position themselves to understand who they are as a teacher so they're better able to go into the classroom and relate and be approachable, accessible to their, to their students. Uh, these are some of the learning goals. So some of the things that we work on is for them to do an educational autobiography, which I'm gonna talk about in just a second. Uh, they're going to generate a uh, teaching and learning philosophy statement, which is a big thing that they will need when they go on to um, begin their slow and long process of finding a job somewhere, which it all feels like that sometimes. Um, no, <laughs> Siri, you get what I was saying. <laughs> so, Hearing some of the presentations earlier, and if this is your situation where you're trying to find common ground to begin conversations with faculty to help them find a place to adopt or look at, consider open practices. This was a goal from the very beginning uh, in this class in just allowing future teachers <coughs> <laughs> have to unlearn all of these traditional pressures or bias in what education may look like uh, from their peers. That, and this is what sits with me when we're looking at open pedagogy, right? Just being openness to share and improving ideas around education, um, looking at issues regarding access, like Nicholas was talking about earlier, everybody has been talking about earlier. Um, part of this class is all of the student generated uh, artifacts that they make, like their autobiography, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, stays available through Canvas for next semester students to be able to come and look at these materials and gain those ideas and see what other people are maybe struggling with when it comes to education so they can find some common voices and some places to feel like, oh, I'm not the only one going through this. We are all in this together and thank goodness